interesting to hear these different talks, for me especially because I know both, all of the people who are speaking in different ways, uh, and just have written or read what they've written. And uh, it's really interesting to hear people talk about things and realize what you disagree with. So I thought I'd start with three things I disagree with. Uh, that'll lead into a conversation later. <coughs> the first one is the uh, definition of nature. It is untenable to me to define nature as something different from humans. Uh, so I go back to the earlier Greek definition of nature, which I'm not a classical scholar, but as I understand it was everything. And so if nature is everything, you have to think of other words to use for the things you want to talk about. So I want to suggest that as an alternative to the definitions of nature we've been hearing today, at least implicit definitions and not formal ones. Uh, the other one is climate change. Um, I have heard people in the San Francisco Bay Area and also here today occasionally do the hopeful design thing and say how climate change is an opportunity. Um, having worked in New Orleans for the last 10 years, climate change is not an opportunity. Climate change is going to be very difficult. And it's going to be difficult because of the economic and political ramifications of all the competition for resources and for funds to be able to adapt and the refugee situations that are going to happen all over the world. So while we think about what we're going to do in our cities, we have to imagine ourselves with an economy in free fall, um, at least at various points. I'm sure it'll be patchy in time and in space, but uh, it's not going to be an opportunity. And every time I hear a designer say there's a silver lining to climate change, I want to go up and shake them and say, you know what? That is a compassion-free statement that you've just made. And it's not even practical in terms of how the economy is going to be affected by it. Um, and then the other thing that I noticed people were talking about was um, connectivity. And I hope that at the end of my talk you'll have a sense of why I'm going to argue today against increasing connectivity. Um, hopefully that will come out through the, what I'm going to be talking about about systems. So um, I'm going to start, first of all I want to thank uh, Fritz and George for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be up here and share the stage with all these people whose work I admire. Um, and because this is a kind of historic event, I wanted to uh, use what uh, Jean-Francois Liazard might have called a petite narrative to make my origin story for what ecological design is. Um, and I'm going to start with the inspiration for a, a design that I was aware of as a student, as a graduate student at Harvard. And if there's anybody in the room at the GSD at Harvard during the time when the death squad graffito was a part of everybody's daily life, that would have been 1982 to 1992, probably. And then the graffito disappeared. Did you see the death squad here? It was um, on the way to the cheese shop. There. The death squad uh, was something people talked about, joked about in studio all the time. It came up as kind of a meme. And uh, there was a studio where Barbara Boardman was challenged to create a uh, proposal for an artificial island. It was a classmate of mine, Barbara Boardman. And she um, had a jury that was made up mostly of people from the museum curation world in New York City um, who had come up to talk to her. And she was trying to bridge, this was during the art and ecology wars um, at the GSD. And she was trying to bridge in her own way between those two. And she described this project by saying, what I want to do is an intersecting set of uh, concrete walls that would provide space for the program, which included being able to walk around, have some maintenance vehicles move around on this artificial island in a very shallow part of the Boston Harbor near Dorchester. And then she said, um, and over time, I think it's possible and even likely that sediment would accrete to this form and uh, salt marsh might form around the shape of the um, concrete walls. And she never said the word fish during her entire presentation. And no one on the jury said the word fish. They got through the entire critique of the project without anyone saying the word fish. And then at the very end, one of the jurors, who was obviously about to pull every hair out of his head, finally couldn't hold it back anymore and said, do you care whether anybody would ever see the skeleton of the fish? And she said no. And that was that. It was a very positive review at United Art and Ecology, and everyone was fine. How many times have you seen a student make the mistake of saying that they do care uh, that people would know about the shape of the fish? Anyway, uh, to me, that's an important example, and one that I've used over 
<clears throat> over the years to help students understand what a dynamic design might be that isn't an analogy to a natural process, but actually does interact with a natural process. The death squad. Fortunately, there are lots of others that have been built. Um, this one is, of course, Michael Van Valkenburg and uh, Matt Urbanski's design for the General Mills headquarters, where they did a prairie planting in front of the corporate headquarters of General Mills. Uh, this was, I believe, in the early 90s. And then they actually burned it right in front of the building, where the president of General Mills would walk in and out. That didn't last. It was a great idea. It was paid for initially by the client, but now they don't burn it anymore. That was too much for the president of uh, General Mills. And at the same, in the same era, actually earlier, um, Michael did this design for the Mill Race Park in Columbus, Indiana. I think it was 88 he started this work. And uh, this is a park next to a river that's going to flood. You can see here a little amphitheater um, area. And that's that same amphitheater area protruding from the flood. This is 1988 to 91 or 92 that he was working on this project. The water park Saragossa in Spain comes 20 years later and is seen as an innovation because people have forgotten this earlier project that was uh, very good in its own right. And then this is my last MBVA project. Uh, the Allegheny Riverfront project that he did in the mid-1990s, uh, again, I think with Matt Urbanski where um, they designed a lower pathway that would allow winter debris, woody debris, to pile up on the pathway and be displayed to the public when they eventually were able to go back after floodwaters would recede. Um, and this poplar planting along here will go from being mostly single stem trees to being multi-stem, kind of a shrub-like condition, as the uh, trees are broken by the large woody debris and they grow back from suckers. So that's a very interesting design, not only revealing a dynamic process, but revealing a physiological process, plant physiology, that changes habit and form, and associations maybe from a forest to a hedge. Uh, but those were good projects. This is another one of that, another image of that uh, shelf area there under construction and then finished on, this, on the right side. Those were good projects that engaged in thinking about how processes could be revealed and integrated and that was that era that uh, Nina Marie was just talking about, about thinking about disturbance regimes and how disturbance regimes could be part of design. So seeing them as part of systems, not something that was a problem, but something we would work with. Um, after that, or actually right around the same time, in 1993, the city of Portland, this is Forest Park in Portland, um, developed a bond measure. They went to their voters and asked for $135 million in a bond that would be paid back through some kind of tax, I was, I'm not sure which one, um, where they would acquire land in a pattern that was based on landscape ecological ideas of connecting large patches with um, waterways. It's the only city park plan from that period that really used landscape ecology to decide which land to buy. Uh, one of the very few that have ever been done in that way. And uh, they didn't communicate well to the public, they lost the first vote, but they got the second vote off in the case. And uh, that project was um, a terrific example of thinking about how dynamics could be part of a spatial pattern. And I think actually the spatial aspects of landscape ecology uh, were easier to at first adopt and translate because they were more like zoning patterns, other kinds of spatial mapping practices we already had, where the temporal piece is harder to get the patterns over time is much more complicated. And of course, we know that the um, dream of the 90s is still alive in Portland. <laughs> and from that same landscape ecological theory, I was able to um, develop a tool that I found useful, which I call the ecological <coughs> figure ground. And I used this uh, to compare four of the schemes that were finalists in the Downsview competition back in, um, sorry, the competition was in 1999, the book came out, I think, in 2000, 2002. And, um, what I liked about this approach was that it allowed me to very quickly map all the woody vegetation in black, all the unmown vegetation that was proposed in gray. Um, and if there were any surface waterways, I think I didn't do it on this one, but uh, the black is woody vegetation and the gray is unmown grasses. So you can see that there is a lot of potential for corridor connectivity in this scheme. Um, there's potential for corridor connectivity in this scheme, but it was mostly grassland corridors, not woodland corridors. And the most potential for the woodland corridors was in this scheme by Shumi, uh, which also had a large patch of grass on it. The largest patch of forest, the largest patch of grassland, and 
it was connected to the uh, stream corridors outside of the site that are very important to the larger scale connectivity in Toronto. And the winner, of course, is this one. So I desperately wish that the jury had made an ecological figure ground, because the intent of the competition was in part to create an interesting ecological landscape. And this is not a very interesting ecological landscape, but they eventually chose. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the movement towards infrastructure that happened, um, has happened during my career, and to point out that uh, it was really the reauthorization of the Clean Water Act in 1987 that prompted stormwater to be such a big deal. Not the original Clean Water Act, which was great, but the requirement that municipalities do the MS4 permits that uh, we heard from the Andrew Pogon team earlier this morning. Uh, and that was a real driver of the developing expertise in landscape architecture. And I, and I look at the LPS, the Landscape Performance Series that we put together at LAF, and sometimes I'm overwhelmed by how many stormwater examples there are in everybody's cases. But there's a reason for that, because what the expertise that we developed was uh, a market for it was created by a change in the law. So I want to point that out because regulatory drivers have been a huge help to us in thinking about this work and um, in addition to urban growth, has also been a big help in terms of having money to spend on infrastructure uh, projects. The um, other piece of legislation was the Endangered Species Act. And as that was applied to Seattle, Portland, and parts of coastal California in 1998, when the Chinook salmon were listed as federally threatened, and that is a huge hammer. The municipalities and counties expected to get fines on the order of tens of thousands of dollars per day they hadn't addressed salmon habitat in the city, both water quality and uh, water quantity problems. So those hammers have really been helpful to us as we uh, think about what we're going to do next. And they have shaped the future of the field. Um, but the, the biological and physical phenomenon of infrastructure interacting with uh, biology, this is a slide that I've shown for years from 95 uh, and from the Seattle Times, which shows, just for anybody who hasn't heard me present this, um, a highway north of Seattle with a, Ch a Chinook salmon going across the highway. And you ask yourself, why did the salmon cross the road? And the answer was because when a vehicle goes by through the flooded water that's on the highway, the fish experience it as if, as if it's a wake. The wake ex is experienced by the fish as if it's down the flow in the river. The river is now a lake back here in this field, so there's no flow in the river. So the fish are, are fanning out looking for the sensation of flow. And all these fish over here are lined up, waiting for their turn to cross <laughs> when the next car comes. And people stop and try to pick up these slimy fish with their skin falling off. I mean, they're returning to die, so they're not in great shape. Um, and they're big. They're three feet long. Uh, so it's an amazing scene to see when this happens. And just because people sometimes think I only have that one photograph, I thought I'd bring a couple of other ones today. <laughs> this one from Oregon, showing the exact same phenomenon. It's becoming an internet meme. And then this one showing a salmon, in this case a sockeye salmon, jumping up into a stormwater outfall. And salmon in the Seattle area go more than 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet in a stormwater pipe, coho salmon in that case, um, to try to get their spawning grounds. So these are amazingly capable animals. This is what I usually work on. This is the underground network of drainage pipes um, under a part of Seattle. Um, and now we'll say I work in New Orleans and uh, the Bay Area, but this is what I call the beast. This is our legacy. This is our capital investment legacy. We are not taking that puppy out. We are going to add to it. We have added to it, but it's not coming out. And sometimes I think of it even as, you know, related to the Minotaur, the classical Greek Minotaur story, where communities make an annual sacrifice to the monster under the castle, under the palace in the maze at Gnosos. Uh, we make an annual sacrifice to this beast. We maintain it with millions of dollars every year in every city just to keep it going. We feed it. We take care of it. And every time we build pieces of infrastructure, we are sacrificing some of the flexibility of our uh, next generation's future because they will have to pay to maintain that piece. So I think we have to be very careful about what it is we decide to build and how we're going to take care of it over the long term. Uh, this early project, this is one of, not the earliest, but um, the second project in Seattle that dealt with 
stormwater. I just want to point it out quickly because there are two aspects of it that often don't hear people <coughs> talk about. It's, this is the block that became the C Street, street edge alternatives in Seattle. It had no formal drainage, just had gutters, uh, not gutters, ditches on the sides um, to convey rainwater. And then it was converted to this, and I know that a lot of urbanists don't like the form. I've had lots of conversations where people are freaking out about the curves. Um, I've seen other forms that aren't curving, so it's not necessarily going to be curved. But it has these uh, berms and uh, bowls along the sides that collect the rainwater and short lengths of pipe that connect them. And now we've seen so many projects like this that it's not that innovative. Um, but I don't know if you know that this is actually cheaper to build one of these than it is to build a regular block. If you're in a neighborhood that doesn't have formal drainage and you want to create street gutter and sidewalk systems, this is cheaper than the traditional by about um, 25%. And, of course, it performs a lot better. This was monitoring data collected by a colleague of mine at the University of Washington, Rich Horner, that showed before it was built and after it was built, how many inches of rain fell during this period, March to July. Um, there's a wake-up call about why I left Seattle. Uh, and then how many cubic feet of runoff resulted from that rainfall in both cases, total, over that period of time? And how many cubic feet per second were the maximum, what was, what was the maximum runoff rate from that block? So this is obviously a very successful design, and the monitoring has made a huge difference um, in Seattle and all over the country and be able to talk about how things work, because most people are from the show-me state. They want to know what it's going to look like, and they want to know how much it's going to cost, and they want to know how it's going to work. And they want to know how you know. And every city is different about that. Some do very expensive modeling studies. I was in Portland, Oregon, where they just pulled up a fire truck to one of the uh, street swales and simulated the 10-year rainfall event with the fire truck. Everybody looked at it, nodded, and said, OK. <laughs> Much less expensive than hiring uh, URS. <laughs> This is a project that I worked on in Seattle. It started in my studio. Um, it's the only, well, one of the few things that I've been able to do in studio that's been implemented. And it's the High Point Neighborhood Project. And it um, has a stormwater pond at the end, which was part of the original design by Methuen. Um, but it has all this stormwater infrastructure up in the streets that decentralizes the way the stormwater is um, detained and uh, treated. And it looks like this along a typical sidewalk where there are um, perennial plantings in a lot of the uh, planting strips, and then runnels that bring that water on your driveways. There are a lot of driveway cuts in this fairly dense, about um, 16 units per acre uh, development. And the thing that was interesting about that process of watching that design evolve and then be eventually implemented was that this was the battleground. This was the Waterloo. This was the, incre this was the Battle of the Bulge. This drawing right here because in order to make it affordable for the city, they could only do it on one side. This is a big trench of uh, soil with a certain amount of void space in it that was going to be used to detain the water. They had to have a side crown street to make that trench be the only trench that would be on the street in order to capture all the water from the street. The street manual said they could not do a side crown street. It took so many muffins to get everyone to finally agree. I don't even want to think about how many muffins were consumed at all the meetings of the engineers and other agencies. But I realized you have to change the right-of-way manual in the United States. Because we don't do top-down planning, we don't do master planning in cities, you have to make space in the manual for innovation. And when you get an innovation that works, you have to change the DNA of the street system. If you don't change the manual, you can't get the change. And that's what I've been explaining to the, trying to explain to the Dutch uh, who are working with in New Orleans, that uh, it's the manual, not the master plan, that operates in the United States. Um, and then just quickly to give a sense of a different aesthetic and how that's evolved, around the same time, a design firm called Lanskap Bogget, uh, Thomas Saxby and Ingebrit Liljekvist in Stockholm, did this development in the neighborhood called um, Hammerby Kruistad, which is a uh, brownfield, was a brownfield site. Uh, they hogged and hauled out all of the contaminated soil and sent it someplace else, maybe Czechoslovakia, I don't know. That's not the most sustainable part. Uh, there are eco ducts for crossing the road, and then there is an amazing stormwater parterre, right here, that's what they called it, which has won the National Architecture Prize in Sweden. The very first time a landscape architecture project, in at least recent memory, has won that prize. 
and you can see a very different neo-modern aesthetic in the architecture and in the development. But here, the public played the role of the developer, um, which I think is very interesting in comparison to the United States, where we very rarely allow the public to play that role. It's very common in Europe. And this last piece here, it's not a fish ladder, it's actually an aeration channel, a sculpture that's designed to add water, and add dissolved oxygen to the water on its way to the Baltic. And then it ends with a weapon um, that does some polishing of nutrients that are coming out of that housing development. So that much cleaner aesthetic doesn't have plants, it doesn't use soil as a medium, so it doesn't get as much paint. But uh, it's a very different aesthetic and certainly works in that context. So here's what I want to get to. Um, I want to talk about <coughs> regime shifts, and in particular, I want to talk about how those regime shifts occur and what the implications are of new research on regime shifts for how we do design. I don't want to just talk about the abstract, I want to talk about it specifically. And luckily I've been set up by the previous speakers who have explained some of these issues. <laughs> Flickering and squealing. It's going to be fun. Um, this is, I, my first degree is in geology, so I always like to put the history, the, what we're doing into a longer context. History to me is in the tens of thousands of years. So uh, this is rates of sea level rise, average global, since the last glaciation. And you can see that there are a lot of fast rates of sea level rise, a lot of eras of very fast sea level rise. And the last eight, 9,000 years has had an anomalously slow rate of sea level rise. And fortunately or unfortunately, well, this is the period in which the world's great deltas formed, because that's what happens when you have a slower rate of sea level, you get all your sediment piling up in one spot, like the conveyor belt is dumping in the same spot for a long period of time. And when we had those deltas, we human beings developed this phenomenon called cities. During this period of time, between seven or eight thousand years ago and the present, first as a very exceptional way of living, and now as more than 50% of the population's way of living. But we developed it during this anomalous time, and now we have to figure out how to make these cities work during what's really a more typical time of uh, more rapid sea level rise. Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are tens of thousands of acres of restored wetland habitat that they've achieved since the 1970s. This has been people's whole lives, their whole careers in the environmental movement or in public agencies has been to build these tens of thousands of acres of wetlands. And uh, those will be gone by 2070 because they're in the intertidal zone. And there will, the intertidal zone is going to be going up and down the face of some riprap wall by 2070 in the San Francisco Bay. Um, and there are patterns of collapse in wetlands where you don't just get it eaten away at little by little. Um, many systems are like this where um, you actually see a pattern that produces collapse uh, fairly suddenly. So it's not necessarily the case that these will gradually disappear. It's probable that unless we think of some way to sustain them by adding a lot of sediment, for example, that they um, will go away uh, more suddenly. And there's a great story, I think I have time to tell, where this is the um, Spartina alterniflora, this more vigorous looking plant. And this is the West Coast native Spartina densiflora. Um, and uh, people in San Francisco have been very freaked out about the East Coast Spartina coming into the Bay Area, and they spent 30 years trying to get it out. It was brought in by the Army Corps for erosion control. It's not that it itself spreads, <coughs> it's that it genetically hybridizes, it reproduces a, a, an offspring, a hybrid offspring, with the native Spartina from the West Coast. And that hybrid offspring is considered an alien to the West Coast. But it's a more vigorous grower, as often happens in hybridization. The, the child is more vigorous than the parents. And uh, exactly what we need at this moment in time in the Bay Area is to have a marsh plant that can grow faster and hold more sediment. So after the last 30 years of eradication, I think we're going to see a change. I'm going to be out there spreading Spartina alterniflora seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and the other irony of it is the last patch of Spartina alterniflora plants in the whole Bay Area that isn't being eradicated with herbicides can't be eradicated because it's habitat for the federally endangered California clapper rail, which apparently doesn't mind that it's not truly the native Spartina. So I think we have a problem with a kind of purism that needs to change, but it's very painful and difficult to change because it's been people's life works. Um, so I'm going to show this graph now because I want to talk about flickering and squealing. Um, these are graphs by a man named Martin Sheffer, who's been pursuing the question about how systems change 
in multiple systems. In medicine, you'll be looking at big data sets for medicine, big data sets for economics, big data sets for ecology. And he's looked at data sets like um, the brain waves before an epileptic seizure, where they can find an early warning signal that the seizure is coming. They've looked at lake data in China and the US, and they've found early warning signals for switching states to a eutrophied state, where the lake is basically dying um, or filling in. And then uh, they've looked at economic data about the US housing crash, and they find that there's a warning signal for that. So economists are now very excited about talking about ecology, and ecology is looking at the methods of economics, studying these statistical patterns to try to figure out where are the warning signals. One of the issues uh, Nina Marie talked about Look at this one that has a short recovery time in the data. There's some kind of disturbance, a flood, or um, an introduction of a lot of capital <coughs> in China, for example, which is what often happens in the US markets. And this one has a slower return time to what its uh, dynamic equilibrium was before. And these Russian Hills models, or ball and basin models, as they're also called, show the uh, speed of recovery using the uh, representation of a slope and here show a lower speed of recovery and the likelihood of a transition using that flatter slope. So that's why these models are so popular and you're seeing a lot of them. Not only is there a change in recovery, difference in recovery time in these two systems, but this one is doing what the ecologists are beginning to call um, squealing. I, I'm making the analogy for myself about a car going into a skid. Picture an ecosystem, but it's a car. And it's going into a skid and people hit the brakes when they're going into a skid. You're not supposed to, but a lot of people do. They hit the brakes on the car, and the squealing sound happens. And the sound looks a little bit like something that starts out small and then gets big. Uh, and that's the squealing. When the variance increases suddenly, like the amplitude of a sound that increases suddenly. And the flickering, here's another version of the squealing. A uh, sudden increase, this would have been a less um, up and down over here, and then suddenly much greater spread or variance in the data. And then you see flickering, where the system state changes almost like events, and then goes back to a different state. And that immediately precedes the real system state shift, that flickering. So it's like watching a car going into a skid, hit the brakes, car starts to turn from side to side, that's my analogy for the flickering, and then it goes into the ditch because they can't get it back on the straight line path they want to take. It changes state. Um, and unfortunately, that's what we're talking about, about these systems. We're not talking about gradual declines. And we're not talking about uh, regime shifts that are reversible or that are multi-directional. We're talking about a predictable, directional regime shift. A change to a state that has uh, lower biodiversity and has less uh, capacity to absorb uh, change and provides many fewer ecosystem services, and that is what's coming. It's not a, you know, it's not a question, that's what's coming, unless we find out something we can do. Um, this is another piece of that paper by Martin Sheffer, where he's talking about two different ways of thinking about system design. One is modularity somewhat disconnected internally. That's his representation here, it looks more like a petri dish. And then this one is highly interconnected internally. Um, as much as possible, basically. And what he's saying is, his hypothesis is that these modular systems may absorb the change more gradually, giving organisms, including people, a chance to adapt over a gradual change. But these highly interconnected ones may at first be more resistant and then have a crash and be in a different system state very suddenly. Um, and this is a hypothesis, but it's an interesting one. Um, that Resistance to change, local repair, and then a critical transition would be a flaw of having more connectivity. And whenever I hear people talking about rebuilding after Hurricane Sandy on the coast of New Jersey and New York, stronger, that's what I think of, a self-repairing system that tries to strengthen the structures, but not come up with a whole new way of doing things. It tries to move back, like we did in New Orleans, like people did in New Orleans. And you understand why. There's a lot of emotional poignancy to this. But at the same time, it's not a good strategy if Sheffer is right, and this is going to be the result. Another example of what's driving these regime shifts is precipitation. This is a new study out in 2013 from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. And it shows 30% um, or greater increase in the maximum precipitation event over much of the northern hemisphere. 
all this green area is going to see big increases, and the darker the green, the bigger the increase in the maximum precipitation event. Um, I worked on the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan uh, with a group of very tall Dutch people. And uh, we developed ways, we've all talked about, using abandoned lots in cities like this to do stormwater storage. But this is an actual plan um, for using some of those abandoned lots in that way, getting temporary detention from those lots, um, and thinking about how they could be uh, used as public spaces, even though they're allowed to flood. Um, and the interesting thing about it is what we're proposing is a change from a highly interconnected physical system, but a really balkanized administrative system. Um, I think it was, uh, Susanna was talking about the balkanization of the soil authorities in New York. Uh, the orange areas here are controlled by the local levy boards, including the walls on this canal. Not the canal, but the walls on the canal, the flood walls. The blue areas are controlled by the water and sewer board, which is local to the city of New Orleans until the pipe gets to be less than 36 inches in diameter, and then it's controlled by the local DPW. So they are competing territorial agencies who do not share budgets or benefits. Um, and thinking about the interconnectedness of this function, at the same time there's a balkanization of administrative responsibility and opportunity, uh, as I think the worst of all worlds. And what we're proposing in the water management plan is that we decentralize as much as possible and I think that's an example of what Sheffer is talking about, about taking systems and making them not so centralized in their connect connectivity. And then, of course, you can put everything in dollar numbers. It's going to be fabulously valuable, what we've proposed, $22 billion in benefits for only $6.2 billion in costs. We've all heard this story. Um, but unfortunately, the benefits also accrue to different agencies than the ones that pay for it. So that's a problem, the balkanization of budgets and benefits. Um, I want to switch gears for a second and talk again about connectivity, but a different way. I was thinking about what, you know, what is the one thing that we could do after this event today to, um, to change the way that uh, we're thinking about landscape architecture and conservation. And I realized while I was on the East Coast that um, north-facing slopes are probably the single biggest conservation priority that we have today that we don't know about. Just like we thought about wetlands in the 1970s, if we conserve today north-facing slopes using Richard Foreman's idea of a ladder rung system on um, corridors formed by stream valleys or formed by shoulders of uh, ridges, we would preserve a place for the last uh, period of time in which char characteristic species from a region can live in that area. These are the portals, or what biologists sometimes call refugia, for those species that we are used to seeing in our areas now. And we need a movement. We need t-shirts. We need blogs. We need Tim to run us a conference um, on biophilic cities and north-facing slopes. Because this is a huge issue that we can deal with now, but we won't be able to deal with uh, during the crisis process of fast change. And then all of our existing conservation areas need to think about how to grow towards north-facing slopes and how to add corridors that are high corridors, corridors that are low corridors, corridors that get animals up and down in elevation and up and down in, well, up in latitude. Up in elevation and up in latitude are going to be the big, important strategic directions. Um, I'm just going to talk about that in terms of a project and then uh, move towards my last subject of my talk. Uh, this project is the East London Green Grid, which some of you may have heard of. And here's the central part of London, right here, historic London. Here's the Canary Wharf, Isle of Dogs area. This is the Thames going out to the sea. Um, what they've done here is purchased all of the land on the tributaries in the eastern part of London and made it public. And what their plan is, is to use that land to store flood water. This is an example in the Lee Valley part of um, London, East London. Uh, and where they have bike trails and walking trails and a lot of these. Um, they're trying to provide much more flood storage in anticipation and in the same, at the same time address an environmental justice issue, which is that East London doesn't have as much access to open space. The other one is the Hackney Marsh, which if anybody's been to it, I think is the largest set of soccer fields I have ever seen. Maybe there's something bigger in China. But this is huge, <laughs> and it serves a huge population and is part of the stormwater infrastructure at this point identified as places designed to flood. 
So the last piece of my talk, and then I'll wrap up, is to think about aesthetic strategies. And that's because, um, in addition to the idea of getting temporal and coming up with anti-skid ecological design strategies, the anti-skid strategies are going to be very important, and the spatial patterns of north-facing slopes, those two first two points, I think we have to obviously bring the public with us, not just the elite of our society using museum exhibits, although that is important. Those people have political influence, they have money, and we need to bring them with us. But we also need to bring the general public with us. And I hope that these aesthetic strategies, I'm just going to name three and give examples. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. I'm sure you all will help think of other ways to do this. Um, but I hope that these aesthetic strategies might make help the public become more able to do the adaptation it's going to need to do. And in a democracy, that is especially important because the politicians can't do the adaptation unless they're supported by polling. And the only way they're going to be supported by polling is if we bring the public with us. The first one I want to talk about is courage to invest. So this is what I think of as a cognitive experience, not an aesthetic experience. Having courage, choosing to make an investment, that's a cognitive experience. But my um, hypothesis, and other people have also had this hypothesis, is that um, aesthetic strategies can make a difference in that. Here's the Thames Barrier. It's a series of towers on the Thames River, obviously. Um, and those towers have stainless steel cladding. This is the photograph most people have seen if they've seen a photograph of the Thames Barrier. Um, and it's a little mysterious what the cladding is about. It looks really cool. And of course, it won an award from the steel cladding people. <laughs> That's how those things go. And the design actually turns a wall which sits in a box on the riverbed up into place with a hydraulic arm when it's needed. So it's a very energy efficient, innovative design. It takes less energy to rotate something with a hydraulic arm and cam than it does to lift it. When I went myself to look at it, I took this photograph, much less lovely than the uh, beaten steel, stainless steel cladding. But this suggests to me that something was going on. I noticed right away that vents are bilateral in symmetry. They're located in side-by-side uh, -side positions, even lights. Uh, these windows are stacked above the central line of the shape. And my hypothesis is that the Greater London Office of Architecture was thinking about this. They did influence the design. And this is the model. That, this is a well-known helmet of an Anglo-Saxon warrior, pardon the little line there, um, that was dug up at the Sutton Hoo archaeological dig in the 1960s. I think this design <coughs> is all about the image of a kind of line of native warriors defending the city of London. And even the lighting of it suggests a kind of return to the hearth as you're coming up and down the river. It's very subtle and very theatrical in what associations people make with it. And they love it. There are lots of videos online that you can find of people going by the Thames Barrier. It's a beloved storm surge barrier. There's no similar Dutch barrier that is so beloved. So the design and the aesthetic strategies are clearly very important. The next one, after the idea of um, inspiring people to feel courageous and connected to their past, is uh, shared resourcefulness. This example I am going to give from the Netherlands. Um, this is one of the best ideas I've seen in coastal design in a long time. It's called the Zandmotor, or sand engine, translated into English. It's just north of Rotterdam. Here's Rotterdam. Um, the Hague is up here a little farther. Or the Hague is right here. And the town of Monster, which is one of my favorites, is right there. Uh, and this area, this is just a huge pile of sand that they put on the beach, off the beach actually, um, in this kind of shape. And then their intention is, they've modeled this, this is model output, of how wind and waves will move that sand to widen their coastline over a period of 10 to 15 years. Widening the beach and raising the level of the dunes by the action of wind and waves. Um, and the reason this is an interesting design in part is because it is cheaper. The Dutch are telling me it's going it, to that this project cost 25% what it would cost to nourish the entire same length of coastline, the one that's going to be taken care of by this over a 10 to 15 year period in traditional with traditional technology. Um, so that's interesting and also very helpful. 
And it's this technology, the rainbowing or side casting, that the Dutch <coughs> use to place more sand in deeper water, which is why it's cheaper. You place more sand in deeper water and don't use bulldozers and don't do it annually, you save a lot of money. Um, and we aren't allowed to use this in the United States right now because it's not precise enough. The Army Corps says it's got to be within a six inch tolerance when you place sand on the beach. Hello. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be necessary. Can we get organized, people? This is what it looked like when it was finished in 2011, this big lump of 28 million cubic yards of sand intended to erode both north and south. <coughs> you could see already after the first uh, few months that the nose of it was developing in a kind of a northward direction. It's provided more habitat because the whole beach and dune area is no longer being driven over with bulldozers every year, so it's had immediate benefits. The dunes are being built by the action of wind at low tide, and it's created the best point break for surfing in all of northern Europe. There is not a downside, really, yet to this. There's one little downside I won't tell you about. <laughs> it fits in. It's OK. It's going to go away in a few years. That's later. And this is what it looks like two years later, where that you can see that sand is moving way down along the coastline. And the beautiful thing about it to me is that um, it teaches people to love something that goes away. We don't have many designs that go away and are loved in the process of going away. <coughs> and yet that's something we all have to figure out how to grapple with, the poignancy of change. So aesthetic strategies that help us think about the poignancy and the beauty of that change are going to be really valuable to us. And the last one is uh, expanded compassion. I thought a lot about this while I was working in New Orleans because I watched while well, the first planning group went down there and said, you know, you've got to move out of the Lower Ninth Ward, you've got to locate on higher ground. And uh, that's not going to happen, not for a long time, not, not for a generation anyway, I think. I mean, in fact, it has in some ways happened. But you have to think about your, how you have compassion for other people during this process, what's actually happening to them, and of course, compassion for other species. And um, one of the ways I think I'm using mostly environmental art examples in this piece because I think there's less of it that's been done in landscape architecture. But the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in DC does offer an example where uh, because of the polished granite, you do see your own face superimposed over the names of other people. And along with the sort of offerings people leave, it is one of the most moving parts of being at the memorial. Uh, there actually is research in another vein that shows that when they did an example, an experiment with students, and they tested to see whether students who sat and waited in front of a large hallway mirror before they went in to a little room to be given a simple test and were offered a chance to cheat, and the investigator would leave a folder with the answers on the table. So they're offered a chance to cheat. The ones, one group sat in front of a mirror in the hallway before they went in. The other group did not sit in front of a mirror before they went in. The group that sat in front of the mirror before they went in cheated at a much lower rate. Reflection, literal and figurative. Uh, Muriel Eucles, who was the New York City sanitation artist in residence um, in the 1980s, did this chromed garbage truck so that people in New York City would see themselves in their garbage truck. Literally and figuratively, it was called the social mirror. It's from 1983. And of course, the FDR memorial that Halpern just uh, had designed and was finally built in DC uses uh, figurative sculpture to make men standing in a bread line. And people will always go to that sculpture to have their picture taken. This is the photo op at the FDR memorial. People sometimes uh, <coughs> excuse me, put their hands on the shoulder of one of the men. Or uh, there's even a, a life-size statue of FDR in his wheelchair. The great thing about bronze is that you can see that people have been sitting on his lap to have their pictures taken because it gets all polished there. Uh, so it's very interesting what works. And this last one is by Joshua Allen Harris. Maybe you've seen this one. It's one of my favorites. He uses trash bags, which he cuts up and glues together. Um, he places them over a subway grate. And when the subway comes under, the wind comes up and inflates the sculpture. So it looks like trash on the street in New York City turns into a polar bear which is a pretty amazing way to make an awareness of other species that are having consequences because of our life choices, have it show up in a not dangerous and scary way um, in the middle of New York. So I want to wrap up by just summarizing uh, what I think needs to be done. 
And we need to go from thinking about disturbance regimes to thinking about directional regime shifts. It's not just up and down, change is happening, could be up, could be down. It's directional. And then ecosystem skids, thinking about using early warning signals and how we would respond. Would we make things more modular, less connected, as a way to address some of these um, changes? Uh, and lower internal connectivity as a response to the early warning. How will we bring the public with us? And for that, I think we have to think about how our aesthetic experiences are connected to cognitive experiences, and how we might use strategies like the ones I mentioned, uh, courage, resourcefulness, and expanding compassion, thinking of those as goals. How can our actual aesthetic tactics produce those cognitive experiences? And 